and welcome back to the way of the one room wizard. I am Robert Andrew Meredith Kennedy and I am a pure and open channel for the finest vibrations of divine love and light made manifest here in service to Tao and those who travel with it. In my last video here I alluded to the fact in recovering in hospital after three major operations you slide back on the list and that gave me time to reflect it also gave me time to realize that most of these videos so far have been tied up around the trauma from nine years ago clearly wizards don't just arrive in the middle of trauma we have to be born so i thought for a change of pace i'd share my childhood growing up poignantly <laughs> While I was reminiscing about my arrival into the world, I was recovering at the time in a very literally several hundred yards from when I arrived in the world. You don't travel far as Kennedys. And at this time I I was born in the summer of 69. A child of the summer of love. Woodstock, all those heady days, a distant thing a distant thing from my parents giving birth to me in Fenbury Hospital. Although these world events were around and the great energies of the time I'm sure were present in many people's lives, it certainly wasn't what I grew up into. I arrived into the world, according to my father, having had Nowhere near as much fun getting me out as he had putting me in. I wonder where I get that sense of humour from. After a few, well, after days of labour, um, I'd become wedged. This enormous wizardly head, of course. And having been wedged, I had to be born by emergency C-section. According to my father, bless him. I emerged a jaundiced, cone-headed, looking vaguely like a naval shell, pretty much wailing into the world, where I then spent the next few days being attended to in an incubator while my mum recovered from, well, from the traumas of a difficult birth. I can't say it's a painting of a particularly rough time, though. That might be to me about that long. And very quickly, we were back home and living in a little flat on the edge of South Hill, somewhere between Tunbridge and Tunbridge Wells. I don't remember very much about it, if I'm honest. Um, a great big cedar tree. I don't know, it's probably a windowsill that I was sat up in. And apparently I was putting a baby bouncer and bounced up and down a lot, including up and down the stairwell, which probably explains the exuberances of my life. And there I lived. I have no more memories. I'd like to say that I, my first memory was the landing of the moon. It happened shortly after my birth, and my father informs me that he sat up with me. He sort of cuddled up, and we watched this momentous event on our little black and white telly in the corner of the room. I have a memory of it. It's not a memory from then. It's the memory of watching it on television over the years. But it's a nice little sport. That was the world I was born into. we just landed on the moon. Things were clearly moving. Technology was advancing, as we're all noticing. And there I lived until the age of three, when my mum fell pregnant with my baby brother. One bedroom flat wasn't going to be big enough, so we moved to the other edge of South Hill. It was a total of three miles or thereabouts. It was a new build. I don't describe up on an estate. My, my birth aunt lived opposite. My granny lived just down the road. Everybody was an auntie and uncle. Nobody seemed to have their doors locked. All the kids played together. We were all, it's just the way it was. It was just a small community. We all went to the same school. We all knew each other. Life was pretty good. It really was that idyllic childhood that we look back on. Do you know what? Yeah, it was. 
no pressure that's something that I remember at that age I mean clearly to have survived an accident was a deep soul planner started my career in broken bones at a young age and my first breaks from a camp as they are so often are I uh, shall we say strong milled three year old or thereabouts defying father who quite sensibly was pointing out that maybe playing with my toy boat on the top of the stairs was not a sensible move um, and I could fall which I then promptly did. Turned the boat around, it got tangled in my legs and I sailed from the top step to the bottom step. To this day I can remember rolling down the stairs. Even the sound of Rice Krispies, this is so weird, the sound of Rice Krispies used to freak me out when I was little, probably from my pops and crackers. It took me years to work out. I arrived in the bottom of the stairs to be scooped up. My next door neighbour at the time was an ambulance driver, acutely summoned and deaf in the arms were broken. And somebody must have been dispatched off to the phone box, because we didn't have a telephone, to ring for an ambulance. My dad, bless him, took me in. Mum was pregnant with my little brother. I mean, he must have been in a rush, because he still tells the story. Apparently he had one shoe on and still had one slipper on. And the wife always pointed out how he arrived in a bit of a rush. Well, with a wailing child in hand, and I obviously just had a hearty breakfast, but they couldn't operate. So Dad basically walked me around the hospital, talking at me, talking to me, showing me things, reading books to me, anything to keep me distracted, and in many ways, learning, as I often say, the basics of pain management. If we're distracted from our pain, we're focused on something else comes easier. It must have done a fairly good trick. I don't remember being massively traumatised by the experience. I certainly ran up and down stairs often enough after that. Often with warnings about falling and breaking my arm. Really. My little brother was born. A joy to the world, bless him. He's been looking after me ever since. For the first three years of his life, I was his interpreter. My brother's almost as weird as me. Almost. until I went to school, or up to the local junior school, sorry, local infant school, that mum realised that much of his needs were communicated through his elder brother, who clearly understood what his weird little language was all about. Oh, that's it. We went to the local village school. Mum was a dinner supervisor. I just, just remember it being easier times. One of the pressures that are my current children, you know, the need to perform. Tests were rare, end of year and things like this. I just don't remember it being a particularly pressured. School wasn't particularly easy, it wasn't particularly hard. I'm looking at my grade results, good average results. I'd put in enough effort, just enough effort. If I was asked for 500 words, they would almost invariably be, and it was all a dream for the last three words as I board of writing. Several teachers commented that they were quite creative works that suffered from stop at exactly what they'd asked for. It very much characterises the way of the lazy old bear, I suppose. I did enough. Enough as I was being asked to do. Like I said, school was fun. It was while I was at school that I broke my right arm for the first time. I grew up, had my baby brother, cousins, friends all around us, all over the estate. Mum and Dad had friends that are still, still family now. I consider the girls to be my sisters. They always visit me and ask me. They stay in touch. And they're both born to different parents. It's just, we just grew up in one large family or large family unit. We holidayed in the same walk, the same caravan site. It's just great days. They really are when you're lying there looking back at our life. Those kind of that kind of start in life it really made sense. 
and went on from infant school to similar grades on to junior school. The reader broke my heart again. This time climbing up onto a roof and trying to recover an icicle for one of my sisters from another nester. Well, basically I came off the roof, fell down and landed on those beautiful metal squares that they used to put outside the classrooms to hook the doors back to. Landed like that, snapped my arm and back off to hospital. I went again with a medical file. It was increasing. It was probably a year or so after that. A um, wrestling incident at school on the crash mats resulted in yet another broken arm. And off I went again, wearing it right throughout this. We often end up waking up next to a good old friend who stayed with me for these many years. And who's broken his bones almost as many times as me. But that's his story to tell. Well, like all breaks, it's just like, like everybody, I look back, I'm sure it wasn't like it at the time. The summers were all long summer holidays. Everything was warm. Every summer was a summer of 77. Every winter we had snow on the ground, sledging in the local park, the local parks, the local fields. Thousands of kids, well, hundreds of kids, well, tens of kids, well, all right, five or six kids, maybe eight, on giant mattresses sailing down hills underneath strips of barbed wire. Well, this was the 70s. Miracle that any of us are still around, to be honest. I spent my days climbing trees, falling out of trees. All of the usual activities of the day, I think. Probably my greatest redeeming feature of childhood was when I joined the Cubs and Scouts. I'm still associated with the Scout Association now. I'm not sure they want to be associated with me, though. Which is why we keep this one at that one. It's so cool. That said, I found Cubs and Scouts to be just good work for me, for the outdoor person that I enjoyed. Always had a love of being outdoors in nature. How it all works, Watch, watching birds, watching insects. When Cubs and Scouts gave us the opportunity to do that, it also gave me an opportunity to excel at the joy of collecting nipperets and tic tacs in an armful of badges soon in cheek. The kind of thing helped when you got a, 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 a reward award based brain like mine. I enjoyed everything, always something new, picking up skills. I mean, these are back in the days when Cubs and Scouts was, was camping, outdoor, backwoods skills, being able to make a fire in any weather, a skill which is useful later in life. It certainly started an interest and became a bit of a thing for me. First, I, given the fact that I am obviously Tad accident prone or adventurous or both. The ability to patch oneself up or to patch oneself up was um, seemed to me to be sensible practice. The ability to better help somebody else with them patched up was also useful. So for much of my early life, first aid was a part of life. I was never put to the test really very much. Most of the injuries, if I'm honest, never happened to anybody around me. They almost invariably happened to me became quite adept at tirelessly working with different hands. As I grew into my body, I became a little less accident prone, with one obvious exception. We were away on scout camp, and me being me, one of the senior scouts at the time, I'd been put to peeling potatoes for some Mr. Norma Poggy Square or something. So I was decided to carve the potatoes up into neat squares using a sheath knife. Somewhat distracted when a fellow scout dropped a tree over my shoulder, I turned and managed to put the knife halfway through that finger. It was but a moment's 
quick lifting to realise that this was slightly more fond of the lead of a band in. So Julie wrapped up what was taken from the camp off to Ross Bell, the same old spot. Dr Julie examined my hand, lifted up the flap, squirting Clara up the wall, while I asked him not to waste too much of it. It would have to be stitched. While I was sitting, laying, or sitting in, in the bed, waiting and stitching, I heard the familiar tones of the old man and the nurse in the background saying, Kennedy, Kennedy, that's an unusual name. I think we've already got one of those. To which he accurately described, tall lad, mullet hair, about yay big. <laughs> Goes by the name of Rob or Robert. Yeah, that's him. And with that, the curtain opened, and there's my dad, and O'Brien, metal fragment from work in his arm. So while he was getting sorted out, and I was getting stitched up, I think I went back to camp, and he went back home. That was my childhood. That was how we grew up. It was physical life. It made me the man I am today, as they say. And I really do, I look back on fun times. I wasn't really didn't really excel at school. Neither did I really fail at school. Good. So what's the point of that then? At school I was tall. I always stood out. And I suppose that started to develop a little bit of a lifetime of a guilt complex or an ability or a want to hold my hand up. Whether the actions were mine or not, in a playground, if anything wrong, I was always first. Yeah, I did it. I was there. Why? You're that tall. If you're that high, that much taller than most of the other folk in your class, there is a tendency to go that you were always present. That or some deep-seated guilt from past life. But it was definitely a theme at the time. I suppose it's helps us not to develop another kind of there was a promise to be made and that appealed to me and it still does. There are good ethics to live our life by. The simplest one is that I lived my life as I did by my scout promise. I did my best. It wasn't perfect, it wasn't brilliant, but I did my best. And I think it's all that anyone can ever ask of ourselves, that we did our best. Well, I've waxed lyrical enough. Nobody needs to hear all of my childhood. I thought for a little aside, I'd share a few joys of long summers. Of basically running wild in the woods and generally immersing myself in the joys of life. Sage advice in these troubled times that we find ourselves now in. That reconnection to nature is essential in our childhoods, is essential in our lives now. wonderful moment when we realise that we are part of this, this is part of us, that flow of life that runs through us, while the experiences that we share with each other fly over the top. Take time for yourselves, it's always sage advice, so I shall retire with grace. Thank you, as always, for listening to the ramblings of an old wild wizard. It certainly helps get the stuff off my chest. Blessed be and go well.